Well, welcome everyone. Today's session will be uh, talking about managing non-agriculture risks for farm and ranch families. So a little bit different twist to it than some of the other uh, sessions you may have uh, participated in here. Um, we are going to talk about farm and ranch families, but we're going to talk about it in the sense of some of the risks that aren't directly related to agriculture. Um, some of the tools we're going to talk about today are health insurance, we're going to talk some about life insurance, and a little tiny bit about disability insurance as well. A little bit of background on myself. Uh, my name is Joel Schumacher. Um, I am an associate specialist in the Department of Agricultural Economics and Economics, and I work uh, for MSU Extension. Um, in addition to um, having a master's degree in applied economics, um, I also am an accredited financial counselor. So I'm going to talk about some of these financial tools um, that we have to help manage some of these risks um, that face farm and ranch families um, every year. Now we're all familiar with agriculture-based risk and many of the um, topics in the series that you're participating in here, you know, have focused on managing and some of the tools that are available to manage things like um, weather-based risks, so drought, hail, maybe you had too much moisture early, too little late, vice versa, early frost, late frost, those kind of things. Um, then there's also issues with diseases and pests and predator loss if you're on the cattle or, or sheep side of things. Um, and then there's certainly risk related to um, market prices, you know, even what the basis will be on delivering of those crops. Um, there's also risk related to, you know, did I pick the right variety of winter wheat to plant this year? Did I plant the right number of spring wheat acres relative to pulses or lentils or oil seeds? You know, when am I, when should I spray my fields? You know, those kind of decisions. Those I'm going to all loosely categorize as, um, you know, an agriculture-based um, risk. Now, there's also non-agriculture based risks that can have an impact on the financial viability of your farmer ranch um, operation as well. And these might be related to illness, uh, you know, whether that's a short-term illness that maybe keeps you, you know, away from work um, for, you know, a period of days, weeks, maybe even a few months, to maybe, you know, um, a more serious illness that keeps you away from work for months or years or possibly even, you know, leads to death. Um, injury, um, certainly farming and ranching, um, there's a number of ways that people can and do get injured. Um, and that, again, may lay you up temporarily or it may lay you up, you know, indefinitely. So the results of these things is, you know, there certainly can be medical costs. Um, you've probably, unless you've been living under a rock, have heard something about health care costs in the U.S. in the last decade. Um, this may also, you know, cause a disability that limits your ability to continue to do the type of work that you were doing, you know, and, and probably in a extreme case, you know, this could lead to premature death. So those are kind of the, the, the results and outcomes. So how do we manage some of these risks? And that's going to be the focus of our time here today. So step one in dealing with risk, are there ways that we can reduce or avoid the risk? altogether or reduce it if possible. So some of these things might simply be things like safer behaviors. So things like wearing your seat belt, you know, can prevent an injury due to a um, automobile accident. You know, same with um, on the farm um, safety. You know, there's lots of times when we're, we're tempted to use equipment on hand that might not be the right equipment for the, for the purpose. Um, so just, you know, taking, um, time and making sure you're doing things properly and in a safe manner is certainly one way to avoid or limit risk. You know, there are some um, agricultural insurers um, in Montana that offer you a discount if you have a farm safety plan, and some of that is dealing with some of these type of safe behaviors um, and equipment, having a plan for different things like that. Um, another one is, you know, kind of on the um, lifestyle side of things would be just healthy habits, so things like, you know, not smoking or using tobacco products, maintaining a reasonable weight, you know, getting enough physical exercise, having a reasonable diet, you know, all of those type of things can, you know, prevent uh, chronic diseases. Um, you know, there's lots of research that sort of supports those things. So those help avoid or reduce your risk of um, some of these non-ag, but they're not going to completely avoid it in many cases. Um, but there are some things, you know, you may decide that, you know, I simply don't have the right equipment. It's too risky for me to do some particular activity, um, and you're going to hire that um, 
out. So that's certainly one alternative as well is to have someone else take on that risk. So that's one option, simply avoid or minimize um, risk to the extent possible, but we're not going to be able to get rid of all the risk that's out there. Um, so another um, tool for managing the risk that you still have um, is going to be to simply prepare financially for those things to happen. So if you know there's a possibility you're going to have two or three thousand dollars in medical bills this year, you know, making sure that you've got um, that much money available to make a payment on that, you know, means that you're, you're prepared to manage the risk that remains. Okay, so sometimes that's in the form of a savings account, you know, a line of credit, you know, some different things like that. Another alternative is to transfer that risk to someone else. So you have the risk, um, but the primarily, primary way that we transfer risk to others is through insurance. Um, so an easy way to think about this is just, you know, in terms of your automobile insurance, you know, every time you get in that vehicle, there's a possibility that you may get in an accident. If it's your fault, um, it may not just be the value of your vehicle, um, but it may be the value of whatever other object you uh, got into an accident with, whether that's another a car or vehicle, which may be very expensive, um, or whether you run into something like a telephone pole and you're responsible for, you know, repair on something like that. So an insurance is a tool we pay so much each month essentially for the insurance company to take on the financial risk that something like that would happen. So we'll talk about some examples of transferring that risk to someone else. Now first let's talk about these in terms of healthcare costs. Um, health insurance is clearly one of the um, number one ways that we can transfer some of that risk to someone else. Um, both the federal and the state government have provided some incentives to save on um, health care expenses that you do end up paying out of pocket. Um, there's some tax benefits for using things, um, health savings account, flexible spending accounts, and then in Montana, the Montana Medical Care Savings Account. So we'll talk a little bit there, but there's been some encouragement by our legislatures to make sure you're prepared um, for uh, risks associated with health care costs. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, medical costs. As, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, if you haven't heard about health care expenses in the last decade, um, I think you've been living in a cave somewhere. Um, they get a lot of press. Uh, they're relatively expensive. Um, so the National Health Expenditure Survey um, for 2016 says that on average in America, we'll spend a little over $10,000 per person on health expenditures. And that's all type of expenditures from prescription drugs to over-the-counter drugs to hospital stays to doctor bills to chiropractor bills to dentists, um, eye doctors, all those kind of things. Um, so $10,000, um, which is a pretty big number. Um, but what's particularly concerning is um, the rate of growth of healthcare spending has been exceeding the gross domestic product. Um, growth rate. And gross domestic product, one way to look at it is it's kind of like the total income for the country. So if healthcare spending is rising at a faster rate than um, sort of total income, that means it's taken a bigger and bigger share of the income essentially of America um, every year. So it's eating up a bigger piece of the pie. So from 2000 to 2010, healthcare growth rate was 5.7% where the GDP growth was 2.9%, so almost double. Now, since 2010, it has slowed a bit. Um, it's only growing at 3.6%. Um, well, GDP rate um, growth has remained relatively constant at 2.9%. So we've narrowed the gap, but it's still um, larger than our GDP growth, which means it's eating up every year a little bit bigger chunk of America's sort of total paycheck. So the next question here, or a fact I wanted to share, with, so where do Montanas get health insurance? Um, obviously, you, you probably heard a lot about the Affordable Care Act and um, over the last few years and Medicaid expansion and Medicare, and you hear all these different terms. Um, well, so the number one source um, for Montanans receiving um, health insurance is through their employer. Um, so almost uh, 450,000 uh, Montanans get health insurance from their employer. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean they're all employees because um, it could be a fam you know, one person working may cover their entire family through the employer plan. 
Okay, so but in total, uh, 450,000 people getting um, health insurance coverage from their employer. Now, Medicare um, is government insurance, um, which essentially nearly all of us are eligible for once we turn age 65. Um, this has got, um, grown in enrollment over the last few years, and part of that's just reflecting the aging population in Montana. So almost 220,000 folks are getting um, their primary insurance through Medicare. And then uh, Medicaid, which uh, has been around for quite a while, um, was primarily designed as a low-income insurance um, vehicle. Um, and then about a couple years ago, as part of the Affordable Care Act, the Montana legislature voted to expand it and allow a higher income group to participate in Medicaid as well. And we'll talk a little more um, in detail about that. But about 250,000 folks are getting their insurance through um, the Medicaid program. A um, little over 80,000 people in Montana are uninsured. Um, this is down a fair bit from years past, but still a fairly sizable um, population. And then um, as part of the Affordable Care Act, um, healthcare.gov, which was created, which is a, they call it the healthcare exchange sometimes. This is where you can go essentially on one website, compare some different plans, and make a purchase of health insurance as an individual or for your family, um, but not through your employer. And about 50,000 Montanans are getting health insurance that way. There are also um, some health insurance individual plans that are sold um, directly by a health insurance broker, not through the healthcare.gov um, platform, and that's about 13,000 Montanans are doing that. Um, the prison population is kind of on a separate insurance. Um, there, there's some double counting here, but um, there are some folks that get their primary insurance essentially through the Department of Corrections while they're incarcerated. Um, the uninsured rate um, in Montana and the United States, just kind of a graph over time. You know, as many of you know, um, the Affordable Care Act was a, a 2009 federal passage, but some of the um, components to that were essentially immediate. Others took a number of years before they were phased in. Um, one of which was, uh, one of the early ones that went in was uh, children were allowed to stay on their parents' health insurance plan longer. Um, other pieces like Medicaid expansion, essentially a choice was given to various states and then they could vote whether to accept those terms or not. So in Montana, um, that piece didn't kick in until um, 2016 as far as Medicaid eligibility um, for the expansion and some states chose not to do that. Um, but the result of a whole variety of different things um, is that the uninsured rate in Montana has fallen from about 18% down to about 8%. So we've had a, you know, more than half of the people who were uninsured in 2009 have now found health insurance. And that's somewhat similar to the national trend, is a little more pronounced here in Montana. Um, but just a couple of kind of quick facts there. Now, um, health insurance sounds good. Uh, of course, um, it's fairly expensive. Um, we talked a little bit about what average health care costs were. Um, about 10000 a year. And one of the, the challenges there is that obviously the insurance has to cover that amount sort of on average. Um, so what does it cost? Well, it depends a lot on what type of coverage. You can get a number of different options available with a plan and uh, what your deductible is, kind of how much you pay before the insurance starts paying, and then also what kind of your coinsurance percentage and what the maximum out-of-pocket cost would be um, over the course of a, of a plan year. Um, I did get a quote here um, for a Gallatin County. Your location does matter um, to some extent. Um, so I, I got what was called a silver plan, um, which we'll talk a, a little bit more about that um, in a minute. Um, but if a person who was age 30 um, would have a $453 monthly premium, age 50 would have $700, by age 60 um, nearly $1,200. Now about 88% of the plans that are purchased through the healthcare.gov exchange um, receive a tax subsidy, so they're not paying the full sticker price. So those folks in Montana, um, you know, are not paying the full price that I listed here above. They're getting some of that back as a tax credit. Um, in Montana, the uh, Commissioner of Securities and Insurance is the overseer um, for the insurance industry, and they have some more examples of some rate data available there. So if you'd like to get some more information, 
um, visit their website and they have some more as well. But just to kind of back up a slide here, or two slides, um, and I'll get my arrow here. These 50,000 folks right here are the ones um, who are 88% of them are receiving a subsidy um, when they're purchasing through the exchange. It's also possible that some of these folks are as well, um, claiming it at year end. Um, it's unlikely that some of these folks are, are claiming it in the same way. Okay. Um, a bronze plan, which would cover... Um, this would kind of be not quite as good of insurance, so the deductible is higher, the out-of-pocket maximum is higher, co-insurance percentage is higher. However, in exchange for kind of having less payments to be made by the insurance company, the premiums are lower. So in this case, um, about $374 for that monthly premium for a 30-year-old, under $600 for a 50-year-old, and, and under $900 for a 60-year-old. So, you know, you can kind of pay more in premiums to get a little better insurance, you know, you can make some different um, trade-offs as well. Um, certainly, I would encourage you to go out to either healthcare.gov if you're interested in seeing what these quotes are or to the Montana Commissioner of Securities and Insurance site. And um, he's got some information. There's some information there that's, um, I think, of use. So the exchange was healthcare.gov, and that was, you know, did not exist prior to the Affordable Care Act. Um, and it created subsidies for what I'm going to call modest income Americans, so between 100 and 400 percent of the federal poverty limit. And I will show you what that is here in just a minute. Um, and then it allowed Medicaid expansion to higher income levels than previously. Essentially, Medicaid was designed to catch the people that were below um, the subsidy levels here in the previous bullet point. And then um, it allowed children to remain on their parents' plan until age 26. Um, previously, it had essentially been um, 18 unless the, the child was doing continuing um, education, and then sometimes they could stay on a little bit longer. Um, and this also uh, put a limit on denials for pre-existing conditions. So it could be um, in the past, if you had a certain condition, um, the insurance company just simply wouldn't offer you a policy. Um, that's been limited under the um, Affordable Care Act. And then it created a penalty for not purchasing insurance. It was based on income. That's since been removed. Um, and for any of you who follow um, you know, federal health care policy, um, it's a little bit of a moving target. There's various proposals and changes that go on all the time. So um, this is kind of some overview of some current facts. However, it could change, you know, really at any point. Now, I mentioned um, the subsidies that 88% of Montanans were receiving that were purchasing um, their, their policy at healthcare.gov or the exchange. And you can find a lot more detailed information at um, healthcare.gov than I'm going to be able to provide you today. Um, but essentially, there's no um, subsidy for folks that are making 100% of the poverty limit or less because they would likely be picked up by the Medicaid expansion. And then um, from 100% to about 400%, you can see um, what the subsidies would be. And essentially, it's, it's based on you pay a certain percentage of your income as the um, monthly premium. Um, towards your policy, and then the additional amount is what the subsidy would be. So as you make more money, um, the subsidy decreases, and, and your portion of the premium um, would be higher. So, but you can the federal poverty limit it varies based on family size. So you can um, go to healthcare.gov and put in your exact situation, and you can get some quotes and determine um, what the quote would be for different types of plans for your particular situation and different type of coverage levels, and also an estimate of what that uh, tax credit subsidy would be if you were to make a purchase um, that way. So the Medicaid expansion um, in Montana, it uh, started accepting enrollment January 1st, 2016, so we're only um, you know a couple years into this. Um, allowed eligibility for adults with income up to 138% of the poverty limit. Um, children ha could have household income a little bit higher. Um, Montana is one of the states that chose to, to charge a premium, which not all states did on the Medicaid expansion. Um, we could, that was all, all referred to as the HELP plan in Montana. Um, but they pay, premiums average 2% of um, 
the applicant's income, so that worked out to be about $26 a month, I believe was the average collected amount um, last year for the premiums for those folks. Here, here are the federal poverty levels for 2018. Um, percentages going up, starting at 138%, and you can see the size of the household. So for a single individual, 200% of the poverty level would be 24,000, 400% would be 48,000. Um, obviously, as the family size grows, they, they add an incremental amount um, to each of those. So um, you can take a moment and see where your uh, family income or individual income falls, and uh, that can give you a little bit of an idea um, whether or not you might be eligible for tax credits to offset some of the cost of purchasing that insurance. Now, employers offer health insurance, and they may vary from this employer to the next employer. You may even have some choices um, at your current um, position of two different types of plans or something. Um, it's not that different um, when we are purchasing health insurance um, through the exchange. They have essentially four levels of health insurance, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum, with platinum being the very best coverage and also the most expensive in terms of monthly premium. Um, most folks, I believe, are buying bronze and silver plans. I think relatively few are, are buying uh, the platinum coverage. Um, but essentially, the trade-off here is if you pay higher monthly premiums, you get more um, benefits, lower out-of-pocket maximums, lower deductibles when it comes time where you actually have that healthcare expense. So, um, you know, you kind of have to get out your crystal ball and see uh, what you expect your expenses to be, what the best case, what the worst case scenario um, could be, and then, um, you know, make a decision kind of on what level of coverage might be appropriate for you. Now, no matter what kind of health insurance you buy, you are going to have some out-of-pocket costs, whether it's a um, co-payment with the doctor's visit, whether it's um, a deductible. Um, so, the Legislatures at both the um, federal and the state level have offered a couple different tools to help folks essentially get um, a discount on some of those out-of-pocket costs. So one is what's called a flexible benefit plan. These are only offered by employers. So again, if your only income is farmer ranch income, it's likely you don't have access to a flexible benefit plan. But essentially, uh, by putting money in, you can save on state and federal income tax. Um, obviously, a lot of Montanans have off-farm income as well, so some farm families may have access to one of these plans through that off-farm employer. Um, and then we have what are called health savings accounts. They're open to anybody that meets the eligibility. We'll talk a little bit about those, what those are. And then um, that's going to save you on federal and state income taxes as well. And then in Montana, um, the eligibility is much more uh, wide open, but essentially any Montana over age 18 can open what's called a Montana Medical Care Savings Account, and that's going to allow you to save on Montana state income taxes um, for those eligible health care expenses. So a couple of the details on these. Um, the flexible spending account, sometimes called a flex plan or a Section 125 plan, also occasionally referred to as a cafeteria plan. Um, allow um, an employee to sign up and have money contributed um, through payroll deduction. The maximum you can put in is $2,600 a year for medical expenses. Um, and then only $500 can be carried over from year to year. So if I signed up um, at the beginning of the year for $2,600 and I only had $1,500 of medical expenses, I would have $1,100 balance in my account. Um, only $500 of that would carry over to the next year. So um, generally, uh, people are pretty cautious and make sure they don't put too much money into these type of accounts. Um, and then any extra could then be carried over if it's under $500. But essentially, it lets you make a payment of these um, before federal and state taxes. So assuming you're in a 25% federal tax bracket and a 6.9% uh, Montana one, you know, if you have a $100 out-of-pocket expense, this could save you $33. Um, by being able to utilize one of these flexible spending accounts on a hundred dollar expense. So if you can utilize these, you know, it's a way to help kind of minimize that risk of, of what that payment would be. Health savings accounts um, allow a person to um, contribute uh, more 
So $3,450 for an individual or a family, $6,900. However, you must have a qualifying high deductible health insurance plan, and most of the plans will be clearly labeled whether they qualify for this, but you need to have some minimum deductibles, um, uh, $1,350 for an individual, $2,700 for a family. The out-of-pocket maximum, however, can't be more than $6,600 for an individual and $13,000 for a family. Um, if you're eligible for these, um, you can put money in. It doesn't expire at the end of the year when you have expenses, eligible expenses. You can withdraw that out. And again, it will save you on state and federal income taxes. So um, excellent way to sort of build up a cushion and, and prepare for the possibility um, that you may have that health care expense, uh, big health care expense in a particular year. So again, a way to manage that out-of-pocket expense. Montana Medical Care Savings Account work in a pretty similar way, although all Montanans over age 18 are um, eligible. Um, $3,500 is the maximum annual contribution. You don't have to use it by the end of each year, um, and you can save just on Montana income taxes here. So most people in Montana are going to be in a 6.9% tax bracket. So again, $100 expense if you were able to uh, reimburse yourself out of your Montana Medical Care Savings Account. That'll save you um, $6.90 for every $100 you're able to um, utilize for the Montana Medical Care um, Savings Accounts. So, um, so just kind of a final wrap-up on, on that component before we move on to the next piece. Um, again, um, health care expenses are certainly a real possibility, but what makes them particularly challenging in terms of farm finances is you may have a year with zero, 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 a couple hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, and then you may have a year with two hundred thousand dollars of expenses. And that big year, or that you know, whatever event happened in that particular time frame, you know, could really wipe out years of equity you've built into your operation. So having um, at least catastrophic medical coverage um, can help protect that equity you've built back into your operation. These healthcare savings accounts I mentioned, whether it's the HSA, the flex plans, or the Montana medical care savings accounts, again, just give you a way to um, um, get a discount essentially on what those out-of-pocket costs are, and therefore protect, again, that equity you've built back into your operation. All right, so let's kind of shift gears a little bit. We'll talk about an unexpected death. Um, life insurance is the primary tool that we think about when we think about um, dying early or, or in an unexpected manner. Um, one of the things that people commonly refer to as is they want to be able to cover funeral costs. You know, in Montana, or these were some U.S. costs from the National Funeral Directors Association. Funeral with cremation, the average cost is about $6,200. With funeral with burial, it's about $8,700. I don't have Montana specific numbers, but um, so, you know, sometimes people want to make sure they have enough life insurance to cover that. But really the number one reason usually is um, income replacement for your dependents. So if your paycheck is currently supporting your family, you know, if you're age 45, um, reasonably they probably were expecting 20 more years of income um, from your paycheck to support um, them. Um, so replacing that um, income stream is oftentimes the number one thing we want to do. But sometimes there's other things too. Maybe you want to pay off the, the house or the ranch or the farm um, in a one-time lump sum, or you want to have money for a, you know children to go to college. You know those things can be added on as well in terms of calculating how much life insurance you might need. So in terms of income replacement, um, I wouldn't. So when determining how much income your family will need. Let's just assume for a minute that you make $50,000. You probably don't need to replace $50,000 of your income for your family because some of that $50,000 was being spent on yourself. Um, they'll have one less family member. Also, you've been doing things like if you have a, a paycheck, you've been paying um, payroll taxes. Um, obviously, you won't be paying payroll taxes on that in the future. So if you if you were bringing you know, if your gross pay was forty or was fifty thousand, it might be that you know you only need to replace thirty thousand or thirty-five thousand um, after your death to 
support your family at the same sort of lifestyle level as before. So it might be better to track what you've been spending um, rather than sort of what your gross pay is. Another thing we want to think about is how many working years do you have left? So how many years are you going to replace this income? If you're age 30, you know, your family might be reasonably expecting 35 more years of earnings from you. If you're age uh, 60, um, you only, you may be planning on retiring in a few years and, and um, you only need to replace, you know, five or seven or ten years of um, income at that point. And then um, how many people are depending on your earnings for their lifestyle? So, you know, if you're a, a single person, age 30, it may be that no one is depending on you. Um, however, if you're uh, the head of a family and you have children, you know, maybe five or six people are. Um, and then how many earners are in your family? If you're 100% of the family income, um, or are you, you know, one of several people in the family that brings home a paycheck? Um, if you're 100%, your life insurance needs are probably going to be a lot higher than if you're, you know, one of several um, individuals contributing income to the family. So again, just a quick example here. You know, let's just say we got a married person with no kids who's age 55. Let's say the husband earns $50,000 a year gross pay. But his take-home pay is only $37,000 because he's paying payroll taxes, um, prepaying income taxes, he's making a contribution to his retirement account, and he's paying for health insurance. Um, and of course, that health insurance won't be needed for if this um, the husband passes away. He's got an IRA and some 401k balance, about $150,000. Now let's also say that his wife works part-time and earns $25,000 a year, and her take-home pays only $18,000. Um, again, for some of the same reasons as we mentioned above. And she also has some money um, saved for retirement as well. So, um, this is what their goal is going to be. They want $10,000 to cover funeral expenses, and they want to replace 10 years of earnings at 80% of what their take-home earnings were. Okay, So that's going to be this $37,000 number right here. We're going to multiply that by 80%, and then we're going to add $10,000 to it, and that's the number that we're going to try to replace. Um, if you want to do a internet search and do life insurance need, life insurance needs calculator, you'll find a whole bunch of these calculators. I'm not going to endorse a particular one. Um, they're all relatively similar. Um, so we put in the basic facts that I showed you a little bit earlier, and it says the husband needs um, $289,000 worth of life insurance. However, he's got $150,000 of retirement savings that he's obviously not going to be needing, that can be utilized to offset some of that need. Okay, so that means he needs to go out and purchase about $140,000 of life insurance is what the calculation would be. The wife, on the other hand, um, on her, this is how much life insurance is on her life. Um, $120,000 is what they, she would need. So $145,000 is the total calculated need there has $25,000 of retirement savings that can go towards covering that amount. If they're going to go out and purchase some insurance, $120,000 will be sufficient um, to meet their goals. Let's change the facts a little bit and say that they're 10 years younger and they needed to replace 20 years of their earnings. And you can see it substantially increases their life insurance needs. You know, the husband now needs about $300,000, the wife needs about $200,000 of um, insurance. So again, the longer the time frame, generally it's going to be more life insurance needs. Um, so as I just mentioned, the more years of income you're trying to replace, the higher your life insurance needs will be. Now the more other savings you have that can be used to kind of offset some of those expenses your family might have, that's going to lower the amount of insurance you need. Um, and then the more one-time things you want to cover, whether that's a funeral costs, you know, kids, uh, college education, pay off the farm, whatever it might be, that's going to increase your um, insurance needs. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about some term life policies and just kind of a strategy that sometimes I see people need. Because 
as we just showed in those examples, your life insurance needs are not constant over the course of your life. They're going to change over time. Um, sometimes what's called layering policies or laddering policies um, can help you meet those needs um, and do all the purchasing sort of um, up front. So our husband here, age 45, $300,000, which is very similar to the example we just had, um, because his needs are going to decline as he gets closer to um, retirement age, less years of income to replace, and probably his um, 401k account is increasing, we're going to have him go out and buy a 10-year policy for $150,000. So that means, you know, from age 45 to age 55, that policy will be in effect. We're also going to have him buy a 20-year policy for $100,000 from age 45 to age 65. And then finally, we'll have him buy a 30-year policy from age that'll cover him from age 45 to 75. So what that means is, at age 46, he's going to have $300,000 of coverage. However, when he's 56, the first policy will have expired and he'll only have $150,000 of coverage. Now, his needs will likely have declined at the same time, but then he won't be paying for insurance kind of that he doesn't need. And uh, as he gets, you know, to age um, 66, his life insurance um, will drop to just $50,000 and then he'll only be paying sort of for the amount that he needs. So um, this is one way to kind of match your life insurance needs um, with some term policies. Um, term life, which is the bottom bullet point here, what I was just talking about, this is coverage for a fixed period of time, and the premium is the same for the life of the policy. And the premiums tend to be lower, especially for younger purchasers um, for term life. So this might be I pay, you know, for the next 10 years I'll pay $300 a year to have this level of coverage at the end of that time period. The policy expires, and I may never receive a payout. There's only a payout if the individual dies during the term of that coverage. Okay, so it's cheaper. However, um, if you don't pass away, there will be no payout on this type of policy. Whole life, on the other hand, you have a constant premium over the over your entire life, um, and the coverage lasts for your entire life. Um, so there will be a payout at some point from a whole life policy. Um, premium tends to be Premiums tend to be higher than term for younger purchasers, um, and sometimes there's a cash value component of that as well. So those are kind of the two main types of insurance. You can meet your needs with a combination of these or um, one or the other as well. Another um, thing to think about is what would happen if you become disabled. You know, it's certainly a disability might prevent you from working or at least working the type of work you've been doing. Um, may also have some medical costs associated that you need to prepare for. Um, Social Security does have a, a disability component to it um, that will provide some basic income, but oftentimes it's not a huge amount. Um, disability insurance is available if that's something that concerns you. You know, if you get disabled and you're unable to work, how will your family replace your income? Disability insurance would be a tool uh, that you could utilize maybe to help meet that need. So kind of a, to wrap up a few things today, hopefully I've given you a few things to think about for managing some of these non-agriculture risks that can have a real impact on your farm or ranch um, finances and, and maybe your ability to be able to do that. Um, so step one is usually going to be to minimize and avoid risk wherever possible. Step two, prepare for some of that risk. That's where some of those savings accounts come in or just having some personal savings so you're prepared for that. And then step three is, you know, transferring some of that risk to others, and insurance is the primary way um, that we do that. So three different steps there for managing risks, um, and hopefully by doing this you can um, increase the likelihood that your agriculture operation will be successful over the long term. So um, final wrap-up here. Um, my contact information is on the screen there. I am certainly happy to take questions on these or if you have some follow-ups. I'm going to point out a couple of uh, quick resources as well. Montana State University Extension does have a MONT guide on the Montana Medical Care Savings Accounts. We also have a MONT guide on um, 
health savings accounts as well. So if you're interested in finding out more information about those, healthcare.gov is a great resource for um, health insurance information. And then the Montana Commissioner of Securities and Insurance, um, which is also sometimes referred to as the State Auditor's Office, um, they have a lot of information about um, insurance as well. So there's some excellent places to go if you want some additional um, information on this topic. So with that, um, I hope you've gained something um, from today's uh, session that will uh, increase the uh, chance that your farm or ranch operation will be financially viable uh, long into the future. With that, have a great day.